The title of the sermon this morning is God's Solution to Your Sorrow. God's Solution to Your Sorrow. And that may sound like a, an unusual topic for Easter Sunday, but really it's the perfect topic because sorrow and grief are things that we all have to experience in life more than once. Some of the toughest things that we have to experience in life. And the answer to your sorrow is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the resurrection is not just something that we believe. It's not just a, an important doctrinal creed. It's actually something that is really relevant to our daily lives. And we're going to see that this morning, that it actually impacts you on an emotional level whenever you go through something very, very difficult in your life. I've read recently that grief is the leading problem that people face today. Grief or sorrow. Sorrow and grief are usually what you experience whenever you lose someone who's close to you. And, but it doesn't just have to be a person. Sorrow and grief are what we experience whenever you experience the death of anything in your life, the loss of anything dear in your life. So it could be the loss of a job, the loss of a career, the loss of a business, the loss of a dream. You could fail out of school, out of college, out of a, a particular major course of studies that you were aiming for, and that could be devastating to you if that was your dream in life. The loss of a marriage, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a friendship, the loss of your reputation. All of these can lead to deep grieving and sorrow. Just recently, a mother reached out to me for advice on dealing with sorrow in their family. Her best friend had just passed away. And her best friend was like an aunt to her son. And so this mother was asking, how do I break the news to my son? Because it's going to devastate him. It's going to be almost like losing his mother. It's just going to crush him. And so she wanted to know, how do I comfort him? How do I counsel him and, and coach him through this very difficult process of grieving and of sorrow? Another uh, recent Recently, another thing that recently happened was somebody in our church came to me after church and, and she said, I can understand how you comfort someone who has just lost someone who they think is going to heaven. But how do you comfort someone who has lost a loved one and they're pretty sure they're probably not going to heaven? I mean, that's a tough one. Grieving and sorrow can be very, very difficult. And there's a very big difference between the normal grieving process and a spirit of grief. It, it, grieving can be normal. It's, it is normal. It's good. It can be healthy. It's something that you have to go through. Uh, you'll cry. You'll weep. You'll go through a, a period of sadness. But eventually, you'll bounce back. You'll learn how to live life in light of what you've lost and you'll learn how to continue to be a productive, healthy Christian. But a spirit of grief is different. That's whenever you lose something in your life, something dear, and grief dominates you. It captures you, uh, and, and you can't seem to break out of it. You go to, into a deep depression, perhaps. Maybe you turn to drugs, alcohol, eating. You might lose friendships. You can lose your relationships, lose a marriage. You can lose a job. It can end in suicide. A spirit of grief can really be crushing. And so we want to make sure as Christians that we go through the normal, normal grieving process without getting captured by this spirit of grief. And so you may be going through a time of sorrow right now. If you're not, you will eventually. And so I want to show you how the Bible and how the resurrection story of Jesus gives us some answers, some solutions to, to dealing with sorrow and with grief. So we're going to look at the Easter story this morning, specifically through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. It's in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Now, if you're new to our church, our church has been studying through the gospel of John verse by verse, um, and we're getting near the end. There's 21 chapters in John. We're in chapter 20. We've made it to the resurrection story. So verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So this story, this particular story of the resurrection, is um, really about Mary Magdalene 
who is Mary Magdalene. Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene, saved her life. She became one of his closest followers. In fact, she was one of several women who followed Jesus around during his years of ministry, ministering to him and to his disciples, ministering to their needs. Um, in John chapter 19, we learn that when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't completely abandoned. There were several, a small group of followers who stayed with him even while he was on the cross, and four of those mentioned were four women. And one of them was Mary Magdalene. She was right there next to the cross as Jesus was being crucified. So it says that early Sunday morning, Mary went to the tomb. She saw that the large stone covering the entrance had been removed, and she ran to tell Peter and John that the body had been taken, that the body had been stolen, is what she assumed, either by grave robbers or the Jews, the Jewish leaders who hated Jesus, or perhaps by the Romans. Verse 3 says that that Peter and the other disciple, this is John, the other disciple is John, the author of this book, the Gospel of John. Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first then also went in, saw, and believed. So John, the author of this gospel, is the first believer in the resurrection. Mary saw the empty tomb. She thought Jesus' body was stolen. Peter didn't know what to think. John was actually the first one to believe in the resurrection. Verse 9, it says, For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So Jesus had repeatedly said, I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. They had no idea what he was talking about. They did not understand. They couldn't comprehend. They couldn't wrap their minds around that concept. And so they weren't expecting him to rise from the grave. They didn't understand the empty tomb. But John, when he saw the grave clothes, it hit him. And then it says in verse 10, Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So Peter and John, they ran to the tomb found it empty. It says that they both saw the, the linen cloths that Christ was wrapped in. They were lying there. And, and the Greek language means that the cloths were laying there in an orderly arrangement, still in their folds, as if the body of Jesus had simply evaporated out of them. And the, and, and the grave clothes just stayed how they were. And then the cloth, the wrapping that was on Christ's head was folded up and it was in a separate place from the rest of the grave cloths. And so this is whenever John believed. Peter and John then ran back to where they were. But Mary, it says in verse 11, but Mary, she stood outside the tomb. She stayed there and she was crying. She was grieving. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you crying? We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Verse four, I'm sorry, the next, uh, next part of verse 13, because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Now, the word woman, like that, woman, it's not like you might think in English. Woman, uh, it's not, it wasn't a term of disrespect. It was sort of like saying madam or ma'am. Jesus said the same thing to his mother whenever uh, she came to him about uh, at the wedding, whenever they ran out of wine, and Jesus said, woman, what has this got to do with me? Well, he wasn't saying, woman. He was saying, ma'am, what does this have to do with me? So same type of thing. He says it several times. But at first, Jesus was standing there. He spoke to her. She didn't know it was Jesus. Now, why didn't she know it was Jesus? Well, we don't know for sure. It doesn't tell us, but it's probably because she was filled with grief and she was crying. She was weeping. Her eyes were 
clouded by her tears. It also could be that she was just looking at him, not directly, but with her peripheral vision. She wasn't focusing on him. She was just weeping, and she saw in a peripheral vision there was a man standing here talking to her. She didn't recognize him as Jesus. Then the next part of the verse says, Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. It's another form of rabbi. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. So today we're going to learn some lessons about how to deal with sorrow from Mary's experience here with the resurrected Christ. What to do with your sorrow. If you're taking notes, here's the first thing. Number one is to realize that everyone experiences sorrow. Realize everyone experiences sorrow because if you get to the point where you feel like I'm the only one, woe is me, it's so terrible for me, I've got it so much worse than everybody else, then you're going to sink in your sorrow. You're going to get stuck. Don't assume as a Christian, that God is going to reward your faithfulness and your devotion with a life free from sorrow. That's simply not the way it works. And in fact, if you look at all of the great Christians, all of the heroes, the saints of the Bible, and look at their stories, all you have to do is read about them and you'll see that they all experience terrible grief and sorrow. Imagine the grief that Adam and Eve felt whenever they were told that they were going to lose the Garden of Eden. Or imagine their grief and their sorrow when they found out that one of their sons was murdered by their other son. Imagine the grief, the sorrow that Abraham felt whenever the Lord told him, you're going to have to sacrifice your beloved son, Isaac. Or imagine the sorrow that Jacob felt whenever he was told that his beloved son, Joseph, was killed by a wild animal. Or for that matter, imagine Joseph's sorrow, Joseph's grief, whenever he finds out that his brothers are selling him into slavery. Then he finds himself in prison, and he's thinking, this is probably my fate for the rest of my life. Imagine David's sorrow whenever he lost his best friend, Jonathan. Or whenever David lost his newborn son with Bathsheba. Or when David lost his son, Absalom. Deep grief and sorrow. Just read the Psalms, most of them written by King David, and you can see him going through so much grief and sorrow throughout his life. And yet this was a man after God's own heart. And yet God let him experience some tough times. And then there's Job. The book of Job tells about Job, a very righteous man, the most righteous man on earth, the Bible says. And yet he experienced the loss of all 10 of his children, the death of all 10 of his children. And so don't assume that your devotion and your faithfulness, and if you tithe and give more than a tithe, and if you tend church often enough, and if you stop that particular sin in your life, that all your problems are going to go away. That's simply not the way that Christianity or that life works. All of us have to experience sorrow. Don't assume that, that sorrow means that God is unfaithful or that God is unreal. God is not the creator of evil and suffering. The Bible says that if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, the creation story that God created everything and then he said it was good. Everything was good. In the, in the beginning, there was no suffering. There was no evil. But when God made mankind, he made us with free will, with the ability to choose to either obey him or to disobey him. And whenever Adam and Eve chose to disobey him, it wrecked everything. It didn't just wreck their relationship with God. It wrecked their relationship with one another. And it threw all of creation into a curse. Everything was thrown out of disharmony. Theologians usually separate two kinds of evils, distinguish between two kinds of evil. There's moral evil and then there's natural evil. Uh, moral evil includes sin, the sins of people, sins like murder and theft and adultery and rape. But then natural evil inc includes things like uh, the coronavirus, diseases, which if that was created by a man, that could also be under moral evil. 
but earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, this is all natural evil. Now, both natural evil and moral evil are the result of sin, of Adam and Eve's choice to disobey God. But sometimes people say, man, how could God be so, if he's so loving, how could he allow so much evil and suffering in the world? Some theologians, though, have really looked at it and estimate that 95% of the evil and the suffering in the world is not caused by natural evil. It's caused by moral evil. It's caused by us, by our sin, and by the way that we treat each other, and by the way that we've rebelled against God, and the way that we do that on a daily basis. All human beings experience sorrow. We all lose loved ones to death. We all get sick. We all experience the loss of things that are dear to us, whether it's a business or or a friendship or a relationship. We all experience failure and heartbreak and disappointment. I say often at Church Cadiana that God never promised to get you out of trouble. He promised to get into trouble with you. God never promised that you would not lose anyone. He promised that you wouldn't lose him. John 16, says, I have told you these things. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. I have told you these things so that you, in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Some of you need to go in your Bibles and highlight and circle that verse. You will have suffering in this world. doesn't matter how much faith you have and how good you are at naming it and claiming it. You're going to have suffering in this world. And then he says, be courageous. I have conquered the world. Now, what did he mean, I have conquered the the world. Here's what that means in a nutshell. It means that there's nothing this world can throw at you that you can't endure with his help. There's nothing this world can do to you to steal your salvation. There's nothing this world can do to you without God's permission. There's nothing this world can do to you to interfere with God's plan for your life. There's nothing this world can do to you to cause God to stop loving you. So an existence with pain and sorrow in this life is not possible, but it is possible in the next life as Christians. So that's the first thing. Realize that you're not alone. Everybody has to experience it. Number two, what to do with your sorrow is to let others share your burden. Let others share your burden. As soon as Mary saw the empty tomb, what did she do? She ran to tell her friends. She ran to tell the other followers of Jesus what had happened. Now, she wasn't telling them good news. She thought she was telling them horrible news that Jesus' body was stolen. So what did she do? She took her grief, her sorrow, and she went and shared it with her Christian family. That's the first thing that we should do. Whenever you experience grief and sorrow, other than pray, take your burdens and give them to God, is you should take them and give them to other Christian brothers and sisters. Let them share that burden with you. And that's exactly the opposite of what many of us do, myself included. I think part of it is pride. I don't like to see people that I'm weak and that I'm suffering and that the loss of something in my life is really getting me down. I want people to think that I'm always up and I'm always joyful because that's what a good Christian does, right? You're always smiling and saying, rejoice in the Lord, God is good. As Christians, we never struggle with sadness and sorrow and depression. That's just not true. And so we, we, we hold it in instead of sharing it. Galatians 6.2 is an important verse. It says, carry one another's burdens. This is speaking to Christians in the context of a church. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Did you know that a burden is something that you cannot carry alone? That's what a burden is. It's something that's so heavy that you can't do it by yourself. It's going to crush you if you try to carry this and burden, hold up this burden by yourself. It will, it will completely crush you. What should we do whenever we see others facing a burden? Well, we should go and help them. That's what it says. Carry one another's burdens. Well, what should we do whenever we're carrying a burden? We should go and tell others, would you please help me carry this burden? We should take our burden and share it with others. We're not made to carry our burdens by ourselves. Did you know some people say, God will never give you more than you can handle. But that's simply not biblical. 
If you look at this verse, it says, carry one another's burdens. Why is that? It's because God at times gives you burdens that you cannot handle on your own. With others, yes. With your church family, holding up your arms, supporting you, yes. But God is going to let you experience things that you, you simply cannot handle healthily on your own. You've got to let others help you carry those burdens. Where do we find these kinds of friends? Well, we find them in the church. This is what the church is built for. Of course, for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also so that we can care for one another. I like to tell people at Church Acadiana, the reason why church is so important is because you need it and you are needed. You need it and you are needed. There are times in your life whenever you're going to be suffering from sorrow and grief and, and burdens that are too heavy for you to bear. And so you're going to need your church family. But then there's going to be times when you're doing okay, but there are going to be others in the church that are in that same situation and they need you. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, comfort the discouraged. Comfort the discouraged. This is specifically, again, speaking to Christians in the context of a Christian community. Comfort those in your church family who are discouraged. And there's always going to be somebody in the church who's discouraged. This is one of the reasons why in our church we have a ministry called home groups. During the weeks, during the week, whenever you can get in a small group Bible study, usually meeting in somebody's house, that's what we call them, a home group. And the purpose of that is so that you can build deep relationships that will already be in place whenever you begin to experience a burden, whenever you begin to experience sorrow and grief, so that you'll already have a group of Christian friends that you're close to that can surround you when you begin to go through that difficult time. As strong as, as Patrick Mahomes is in the NFL, as talented as he is, can you imagine if he tried to go out there and play one on 11? Who's he going to hand the ball off to? Who's he going to pass to? Who's going to block for him? He just can't do it. He would get crushed. We're not made to do life alone. Don't carry your sorrow alone. Call somebody. Have somebody... Take somebody out to coffee and just tell them, I just need to share my heart. I need you to pray for me. I need some advice. Sometimes you just need somebody to talk to. Number three, what to do with your sorrow is to set your mind on God's promises. Set your mind on God's promises. I want you to, to see this in the text. It's really interesting. Remember that Mary, when she looked in the tomb, who did she see? Pop quiz. Who did she see? She saw two angels. One was sitting at the foot where Jesus was laying, the other at the head. And the angels added, asked her an odd question. What are you so upset about? What are you crying for? And then she had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus said, what are you so upset about? Why are you crying? That sounds like a very insensitive question. They know why she's crying. Why are they asking this? Well, it's because... On multiple occasions, Jesus had told his disciples, and Mary was present, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise from the grave. And here you see the empty tomb. This should be a time for celebration, a time to say, he is risen indeed, and yet you're grieving. You're weeping. You're sorrowful. Why? Because she had taken her eyes off of the promises of God. She wasn't focused on Jesus' promise to rise from the grave. She was focused on what she'd lost. She wasn't looking for Jesus' risen body. She was looking for his dead body so that she could rebury him. And so if we want to get through grief and sorrow appropriately, we've got to focus on God's promises. I'm not saying you need to ignore what's happened to you and ignore the bad stuff, ignore the grief, and just, you know, out of sight, out of mind. That's not going to happen. But while you're grieving, never take your eyes off of God's promises. One of the best promises in the Bible is Romans 8, 28. Some of you know it well. We talk about it a lot at Church Acadiana because we lean on it a lot in our personal lives, don't we? It says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things work together for the good of those who love God. Often what appears to be the end is actually a new beginning. What appears to be the end of something good is actually the start of something even better. And that's just the biblical truth. 
What appears to be a loss is actually a gain. What appears to be a setback is actually a setup for something better. Joseph, again, was, we talked about Joseph a little earlier. He was his father's favorite son. His brothers sold him into slavery. Then he gets falsely accused of sexual assault, of rape. They threw him into prison. So now he's in prison in a dungeon in a foreign land. His father thinks he's dead, doesn't even know where he is. I'm sure Joseph thought he had lost it all. He lost his fortune. He was sure to inherit the bulk of his father's inheritance. He lost all that, lost his family, lost his reputation. Now he's seen as a criminal, as a a rapist. He's lost his future. He's lost it all. Can you imagine his sorrow? And yet what appeared to be a setback was only a setup for something better. God eventually elevated Joseph out of prison to become prime minister of Egypt, where God used him to save millions of people from a famine, a worldwide famine, including his own family. And then you take the story of Moses. It's another great example. Moses was the prince of Egypt. He was sure to become somebody very important when he grew up in Egypt, to be extremely wealthy, live in the palace, have a place of prominence and of power and of fame, could have anything he wanted. And then one day, he murders an Egyptian. He kills an Egyptian. And so Moses has to run for his life. And I'm sure Moses thought, it's over for me. I've lost it all. I've lost everything. I lost my inheritance, lost the palace, lost my my good name, lost my friends, family. I've lost it all. He spends the next 40 years in the desert as a shepherd. But God wasn't through with him. This was all part of God's plan. God was growing him and preparing him. What, What appeared to be a setback was just a setup for something better. And so God eventually elevated Moses to a position of leadership to go and to rescue the Israelites and to lead them out of Egypt, out of slavery to the promised land. And that's what God does. God works all things together for the good. What appears to be the end is is always the beginning of something new, something better that God has for us. David was one of King Saul's inside men. I love this story. David was the champion of Israel. He was Saul's best general. He was going to um, marry one of Saul's daughters. He was just, he was best friends with the king's son. God even sent his prophet to anoint David to be the next king. I mean, David was on his way to the top. But then King Saul turned against him. And Saul began to treat David like public enemy number one. David goes on the run. He's living in the desert, in the wilderness. He's living in caves. He's living in foreign lands with the Philistines, the hated Philistines. I'm sure he at times thought, it's over. I've lost it all. But what appeared to be a setback was only a setup for something better. God was using all of this to grow his character so that eventually he would become appointed to be the next king of Israel after Saul passed away. The Bible says that God is working through our sorrow. He's working through the tough stuff. He uses difficulties to grow us, to prepare us for bigger responsibilities down the road. He uses difficulties to move us to where he wants us to go, to lead and guide and direct us, to say, no, not this way. I want you to go this way. He uses difficulties to protect us from greater harm down the road. He uses difficulties to open up new ministry opportunities. He uses difficulties to stop us from making bad decisions. He uses difficulties to humble us and to keep us dependent on him. One author said, God loves to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones and crucifixions into resurrections. This is why the Bible says that as Christians, we should rejoice in the Lord always and that we should give thanks in all circumstances. We don't rejoice in the Lord always for everything. We don't give thanks for everything but we can rejoice in everything. We can give thanks in the the midst of all circumstances because we're keeping our eyes on the promises of God and we know he's working it all out for our good. And so keep your eyes on God's promises. What do you do with your sorrow? Here's number four. It's to know that Jesus is near. Know that Jesus is near. Whenever you're going through a tough time, a time of grief and sorrow, know that Jesus is near. Notice that 
while Mary was weeping because she was thinking they've stolen Jesus' body, the tomb is, is empty, he's gone, we'll probably never get his body back, she's weeping, Jesus was next to her. He was standing right behind her. And her eyes were so full of tears that she didn't even notice that it was Jesus when he spoke to her at first. But then, whenever he said her name, Mary, then she realized it was Jesus. When she realized that Jesus was near, her sorrow turned to joy, completely changed her. Whenever we remember that Jesus is near, as we're going through difficult times, it will completely change your perspective. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, where he is today, he told his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, and remember, I am with you always. I'm with you always to the end of the age. Psalm 139, 5. Psalm 139 is the classic text on God's omnipresence. King David wrote this. He said, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, Sheol refers to death. If I make, make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. Why is the thought of Christ's nearness comforting? whenever you're going through a difficult time, why is that comforting? Because it means that, that he knows. It means that he knows what you're going through. He knows your situation. He knows how you feel. He knows what's happened to you. He knows what people have done to you. He knows how people have wronged you. He knows your needs. He knows what you feel like. He knows whenever your back is up against the wall. He knows because he's there. He's near. There's a popular song by Jeremy Camp that goes by that very name. He knows. You ever heard that song? The chorus goes like this. He knows, he knows every hurt and every sting. He has walked the suffering. He knows, he knows. Let your burdens come undone. Lift your eyes up to the one who knows. He knows. It also means that he hears. The fact that Jesus is near, it means he hears. And that's so important. Whenever you're going through a difficult time, Jesus hears your crying. He hears your prayers. He's listening to you. You're not, you're not speaking just to a ceiling or to a wall. He hears you. He's alive. Psalm 6, 8 through 9 says, The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea for help. The Lord accepts my prayer. I remember one of my uh, kids was going through a time, one of my daughters was going through a time uh, of, of sorrow because she, she didn't have any friends. Of course, she had me, and I thought that was enough. But she wanted some more friends, and, uh, and, and she was just, just complaining about this, and just, it was just tough on her. And so, you know, as a father, I, I want to meet my daughter's needs, of course, and so I just want to give her whatever she needs to be happy, and there's only so much I can do. I can't just produce friends for her. And so ultimately, I came to the end of my rope, and I said, listen, you got to pray. God loves you, and he knows what you need. He wants to meet your needs, so tell him, Lord, I want some friends. I need some friends. I'm lonely. And so she did that, and it was at that time, right at that time, that God began to bring one friend after another into her life. God hears because Jesus is near. It also means that you're not alone. The fact that Jesus is near when you're suffering and when you're going through sorrow means that you're not alone. God has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. Jesus is right there next to you the whole time. Here's number five. What do you do with your sorrow? You got to believe that Jesus is alive. Believe that Jesus is alive. I want to show you how the resurrection is so practical for our times of suffering and sorrow. Whenever Jesus called Mary's name, she knew immediately it was him. When he said Mary, she knew immediately that's Jesus. And her sorrow turned to joy. Why did, did she get so happy when she heard Jesus' voice, when she knew that he was alive, was because if Jesus is alive, and she knew this, if Jesus is alive, if, the, if he re rose from the grave, this changes everything. This changes everything. 
Now, there are many wonderful implications of the resurrection. What does the resurrection mean for us? What are the, there's so many implications, and that's why you can preach so many different sermons on the Easter story. Because Jesus rose from the grave, it means that he's God. I mean, he's a guy who says he's God. Anybody can say they're God, but he says he's God. Then he says, I'm going to die and rise from the grave on the third day, and he did it. Because he rose from the grave, we know that he's trustworthy. We can trust everything he says now because he said he was going to rise from the grave, and he did. We know that he can save us from sin. Listen, if he can rise from the grave, then surely he can save our sins. And we know that he's worthy of worship because he rose from the grave. He is worthy of our worship. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's worthy of our devotion, our obedience. But one of the most practical aspects and implications of the resurrection for our daily lives and in the different types of, different types of suffering and sorrow that we experience is that if Christ rose from the grave, then that means he is powerful enough to help me with what I'm going through. If he's able to conquer death and he's alive today, then that means he can help me with whatever I'm facing. Not only that, but if he can conquer the grave, then that means there's nothing I will ever go through that's too big for Christ to help me with. Some skeptics will ask, how can you believe that God created the universe from nothing? How can you believe that God parted the Red Sea? How can you believe that Jesus did all those miracles, making the blind see, healing the lepers, feeding 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and fish. How can you believe all that stuff? Well, because Jesus rose from the grave. And if he rose from the grave, he can do anything. He can do anything. And so believe that Jesus is alive. Remember that he's alive whenever you go through something difficult. And then number six, I've got two more for, the, for you. And number six, what do you do with your sorrow? Is stay focused on your mission. This is so important. Stay focused on your mission, on your calling in life. Now, when Mary realized that Jesus was alive, what did she want to do? She wanted to hold on to him. She wanted to hug him and, and just, just spend time with him. And Lord, let's go out to eat now. Let's just, just hang out. I just want to be with you every second. So Jesus says, don't cling to me. Now, he wasn't being insensitive. What he meant when he says, don't cling to me, is, hey, I've got a job for you to do. I've got a mission for you. I know you'd love to just, let's just hang out right now and hug and hold each other, but I've got something for you to do. Go and tell my disciples that I'm alive. And this is why Mary, Mary is the first, Mary Magdalene, this, this, this woman who many scholars think was um, a woman of sin, a prostitute. She was possessed by seven demons. And yet God chose Mary Magdalene to be the first eyewitness to the resurrection. A woman, a woman of sin. And God chose her. This is why many scholars call Mary the first evangelist. Because she was the first one to go in to tell others, Jesus is alive. I've seen him with my own eyes. Grief can be good. It can be appropriate. It's necessary. Grieving can be healing. It can be cleansing. And there's nothing wrong with crying, with mourning, with going through a time of sadness. But you can't stay that way forever because God has work for you to do. But if you forget that, then you'll stay in your grief. You have to remember that God has a mission for you. He's got a calling on your life. There's work to be done. You may have lost something, but you didn't lose your life. Somebody else may have passed away, but you have it. You're still here, which means God's not done with you yet. He's got stuff for you to do. It's natural to take some time off whenever you're sad and to break away from your normal routine, but don't break for too long. He's got a mission for you. He's got work for you to do. He's got a spouse for you to take care of and to minister to, and children to raise and to lead to Christ, and maybe some parents to take care of, and a church family that needs you. You know, one of our ministries at Church Katiana is a monthly men's Bible study. And we have it at my house the second Tuesday of every month. And I would love for all of you men to come and, and be a part of it. We eat together, and then we just have a Bible study. And if you have a son or a grandson or a nephew or a friend who's 12 years old or over, you can bring him too. And the, the purpose of men's Bible study is to equip men 
to be the spiritual leaders of their families, to equip men to lead their families to Christ. Because, man, you have a job to do. God has a calling on your life, and no matter what you go through, what hard time you go through, God has a plan for you. You, you, you are needed. You've got children, grandchildren, a spouse, a church that needs you to be a strong man of God, leading people to Jesus. Here's the cool thing about staying focused on your mission. If you stay focused on your mission, whenever grief enters into your life, then you're not going to be captured by your grief. Because it's hard to stay depressed when you're trying to tell your, your kids about Jesus. It's hard to be overcome by sorrow whenever you're volunteering at church. In other words, whenever you're getting your hands dirty and you're staying busy, it's hard to wallow in your grief. The devil wants to use your grief to distract you from your mission. God wants to use your mission to help you live with your grief. And so whenever you experience loss, don't lose your mission. Don't lose sight of God's calling on your life. Here's number seven. What do you do with your sorrow as a Christian? Look forward to heaven. Look forward to heaven. So throughout his ministry, Jesus often talked to his followers about eternal life. He often told, remember, Jesus told his disciples in John 3, 16, whoever believes in me will not perish, but have eternal life. He said in John chapter 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. He said in John 14, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you there to be with me. He was always talking to them about the afterlife, about everlasting life, about eternal life. But when Jesus died, there was no way for them to know whether or not he was telling the truth or whether or not his words were true. He died. Who's to say now that, that we're going to have eternal life, that there's life after death? Our Savior, our Lord, he's dead. But when he rose from the grave and when Mary encountered the risen Lord, she knew what that meant. She knew if he rose, we will rise. If there's life after death for Jesus, well, he promised there's going to be life after death for us. For those that believe in Christ, there will be eternal life. And that's something, man, that, that you need to focus on whenever you're going through times of sorrow. The thought of heaven can help you endure just about anything because the pain that you're experiencing is only temporary. Even if you have 72 years in this life of misery and suffering and sorrow and loss, you're going to spend the rest of eternity in paradise. Listen to the words of Paul in Romans 8.18. He says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of what is going to be revealed to us. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory with heaven that is going to be revealed to us. What did Paul mean? Well, imagine that the first day of 2022 was the worst day of your life. It was a very bad, no good, ugly day, like that little book. I don't know exactly how it goes. Horrible day. So you get in a wreck, total your car, break your neck. The person you get in a wreck with, the other car, happened to be driven by your wife. She breaks her hip. You find out your best friend is spreading bad rumors about you. You lose your job. I mean, it's just a horrible day. But then, the next day, day two of 2022, turns out to be an amazing day. You find out that you had this dead uncle who wants to leave his inheritance of $50 million to you. And I know that you guys as Christians, you don't care about money, but it brightens your day a little bit. And it just things start falling into place. I mean, as you heal up, your marriage is great. You get offered this promotion at work, the job that you've always wanted. The New York Times, who you don't like anyway, but they decide to make you the person of the year. You find out that your wife is pregnant with your first child, and she wants to name him after you. And I mean, just this life is all this. And, then, and just the rest of the year is like this. 
And so in 2023, somebody comes along and he says, so how was your 2022? Now, you're naturally going to say, man, it was amazing. I just had this awesome year. You're not going to say, man, the first day was just terrible. It was just horrible. It was the worst day. You're not even going to think about that because 364 days of that year were just amazing. Well, that's how it's going to be whenever you get to heaven. You may have to live 72, 75 years of suffering, but compared to an eternity of glory in the presence of God with other believers, with no sin, sorrow, suffering, no shame, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like your existence was amazing, was just absolutely awesome. And that's what Paul meant. There's a Christian woman, a famous Christian woman who lived a life of deprivation and of starvation, suffering. At the end of her life, she said this, in light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth, a life of the most atrocious tortures on the planet in the light of heaven will be seen to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. I know of one pastor, a few years ago, he was one of these best-selling authors. He was uh, one of these megachurch pastors, had the respect of all of his peers, started this church that was huge. He was invited to speak at all the conferences. And then it was discovered that he was having an affair. And so after that, he lost his ministry, lost his, his um, church, lost his reputation. No more book deals, no more speaking invitations, lost his reputation. And about two years after that, he took his life. He tried to, to deal with the sorrow, but he was overcome by a spirit of grief. Then I know another pastor, and I'm telling you pastor stories because I, I'm a pastor. I follow pastor stories. Another pastor. This just happened a few years ago. He, was the, he started a church that became one of the largest churches in the country. And he had the book deals, and he was famous, and he was going to all the, the conferences as a speaker and had the respect of all of his peers, all the things you want as a man, you, you kind of dream about all of this worldly success. But then his old drinking habit that he had before he became a Christian caught up with him. And that's how he dealt with the stress of this huge mega church. He started to drink. And it was discovered he ended up losing his church, his ministry. He ended up losing his marriage. His wife left him and divorced him. Lost his friends, lost it all. But then about two years after that, he... He was started to go through a time of healing and of growth. Two years after that, he started a new church, got back into the ministry. His new church is thriving. He called his new church Second Chance Church because he's not the only one who needs a second chance, is he? We all need second chances. And he used his heartbreak and his sorrow and his suffering to help other people. And see, those are the two different ways that you can see somebody deal with sorrow and grief. Some can be overcome with a spirit of grief. Grief, some can go through a normal grieving process. You will experience grief and sorrow, but it doesn't have to kill you. It doesn't have to overwhelm you. The key is to give your grief to Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Christ can comfort you and strengthen you and use it for your good, but you got to give it to him. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus Christ into your life, to become a Christian. And so you may know all about God. You may know all about the Bible. You may have been going to church for years. But if I were to ask you today, how's your relationship with Jesus? Do you have a real relationship with Jesus? And if you die right now, are you going to heaven? Some of you might say, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not sure. And so I want to give you an opportunity right now to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And so we're going to have just a brief time of prayer, and then I'll release you. Why don't you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? This morning, if you're not sure that you're a Christian, if you're not sure that you're saved, if you're not sure that if you died today that you'd go to heaven, if you're just not sure where you stand with God, then right now is the best time. Easter Sunday is the best time to commit your life to Christ and ask Jesus to save you because you don't know if you'll have a tomorrow. You don't know if you'll have another chance to do this. 
but God loves you. God sent his son to die on the cross for your sins so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. And he rose again. And the Bible says that if you'll make a decision to turn from your sins and put your faith in Jesus, commit your life to him, that God will save you right here and right now and give you eternal life and forgive your sins. But you have to make that decision. And so right now, where you're sitting, nobody's looking around. I just want to give you an opportunity. If you're not sure where you stand with God, to ask Jesus to come and save you right now. And so just pray a prayer like this. Won't you, won't you repeat this after me? Repeat it in the quiet of your heart. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry that I sinned against you. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again. And I ask you to come into my life and save me. And give me new life. And change me. I commit myself to you from this day forward. Just take a moment in the quiet of your own heart to pray a prayer like that one. If you want to be saved right now, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ right now, you just pray that prayer right where you sit. I'm just going to give you a moment of silence. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you just prayed to ask Jesus to come into your life to save you, nobody, nobody's looking but me, but I want to pray for you. And so when I count to three, I just want you to lift up your hand if you just ask Jesus to come and save you. Now, this, is, this, is, this is nothing to be ashamed of. This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And I love you, and I just want to pray for you and encourage you. So nobody's looking around but me. When I count to three, you just lift your hand up if you just ask Jesus to come into your life. One, two, three. Amen. All over the room. All over the room. You are not alone. All over the room. Men, women, boys and girls asking Jesus. Amen. I'm so proud of you. You can put your hands down. It's the most wonderful decision you can make. Anybody else in this room, there's still an opportunity. If you haven't raised your hand yet, would you just raise your hand if you ask Jesus to come into your life? Amen. God bless you. God bless you. In a moment, I'm going to pray for you. Our church is going to pray for you. And then whenever we leave this morning, what I want you to do is make this, this is going to take a little bit of courage, but on your connection card, I want you to, there's a little checkbox on the back that says, I trusted in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior for the first time this morning. There's a little box you can check off. And I want you to check that box off for me so that I can continue to pray for you. Some of you may not have raised your hand, but you did make that decision. Check off that box. I want to pray for you. I want to send you something in the mail that will help you grow as a Christian. But this is the most important day of your life, is starting a relationship with Jesus. So don't lose this opportunity. Check that off on your connection card. Let me pray for you. And then we'll, we'll go. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for sending Jesus to rescue us because we need a Savior. All of us in this room are sinners. We are headed straight for hell without Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you came and you died and you rose again and you're alive today and you love us and you're watching over us. Lord, we pray for those men and women, boys and girls this morning who invited you into their lives. We pray, Lord, for their salvation. We pray, God, that you would grow them and encourage them and get them plugged into church where they can become a useful follower of Jesus. Protect them, Lord. Love on them and help our church to do the same. We pray, God, that we'll take the message of Jesus Christ and salvation in his name wherever we go. Spread the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter. Thank you for coming this morning. Don't forget to turn in your connection cards as you go. And we hope to see you all next Sunday. God bless you.